in the Gospel of Matthew now for, I guess, a year. And we have separated the series in different sub-series. We've been talking about the proclamation of his kingdom because, as you know, Matthew presents Jesus as the majestic king, the king of kings. Today I want to talk to you about the maturing of his followers. Jesus Christ, as you know, sent his 12 disciples who became apostles into the lost sheep of Israel, he said. And uh, they needed to mature. They needed to learn what it means to uh, follow Christ uh, closely and faithfully. And therefore, these words are applicable to us today because we need to mature. One thing we know about the, one of the attributes of God is his uh, unchanging, unchanging nature. God will not change which gives us great comfort, right? He never learns anything, but we do, and we need to change. We need to mature. We need to be more like Christ, and that is what Jesus is doing to his disciples, and then obviously that applies to us as well. Last week, I introduced the lesson by telling you a brief story about a missionary in Australia who died in 1999. He was killed by the very people he was trying to reach. Today, I want to do something similar in borrow from the diary of Jim Elliot. You may have heard of him. Um, and I want to illustrate the, the, the theme of this sermon here. Elliot, along with his four, uh, four companions, Ed McCulley, Roger Udarian, Pete Fleming, and Nate Saint, died in 1956 at the hands of the natives of the Guarani tribe in Ecuador, the very people whom they were trying to reach. And Jim Elliot, our fellow Oregonian, wrote this in his diary, quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose, close quote. And ultimately, he paid the ultimate price by being speared to death by the people he was trying to reach. But those are the words of a mature believer, someone who has godly leadership, someone who understands the cost of faithfulness, faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And in case you haven't noticed, the world craves for men like this, people who lead like that. Uh, we... We are in short supply of uh, godly, mature leadership like that. Our generation is so confused about our own identity that we lost uh, sight of what it means to lead Christ -like, uh, like, like Christ. Now, what else do you expect when you remove the Bible from the public square? Now, the year of the pandemic has given us many opportunities to observe civics and our civic leaders. And we've been disappointed, of course. But I wish I could say things were different in the spiritual realm. They are not. But Jesus has a lot to teach us today, and I, I hope that you are excited to learn and to mature in him. We can turn to our Bibles and learn from the majestic Savior, the perfect, sinless leader. And like his 12 disciples here, he called you and me to lead and to be like him, he, you are called to uh, spiritual leadership. It doesn't matter whether or not you have the title of pastor, elder, deacon, or, or whatever. You are a spiritual leader if you are a follower of Christ. We are spouses. We are children. We are brothers and sisters. We are members of our community. And the world is looking at us and how we respond to a global crisis or a personal crisis. Crisis. So therefore, my friend, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, he expects you to lead according to his personality, his character. So this is what he has to say to his followers. I'm in Matthew 10. We're going to read from verses 24 to 33. He says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Therefore, do not fear them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who killed the body but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. 
Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And that's how Jesus prepares his disciples for what they are about to face. And this is a very simple threefold outline, a threefold strategy for spiritual maturity that we can follow. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Jesus' threefold strategy for spiritual maturity, and I hope that we will follow this even after we're uh, um, done here. So the, the, the first point in his threefold outline is acknowledge your position. That's what he's saying. Verses 24 to 25, acknowledge your position. Jesus reminds his disciples about his position as master and teacher, and therefore they would understand their position as followers. Now, by presenting this timeless principle, Jesus makes it clear that those instructions uh, transcend that particular generation of disciples of Christ. So if you are a disciple of Christ, uh, the first thing to notice and the first thing to learn today is you need to acknowledge your position. Why? Because you will never rise above your master and teacher. You're not supposed to. Remember, Satan wanted to do that. In uh, Isaiah 14, verse 13, it says, I will ascend to heaven. I will rise my, raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. That's what Satan wanted to do. But Jesus Christ says here to the disciples, you will never rise above your master and teacher. Elsewhere, he reminded them that not only are they going to follow in his footsteps concerning opposition and conflict, but also in influence. This is what he said, John 15, verse 20. Remember the, uh, the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. As, and they, if they follow my word, they will follow yours also. So he's assuring to them that you're never going to be above Christ, but you can be like Jesus Christ, not only in opposition and in persecution and in criticism, but also in influence. And that is the blessing of being a member of the family of Christ. Being a subject of the kingdom of heaven is that we get to influence people for Christ. We don't get any credit for it because it's not about us anyway, but we get to influence people for the good. In verse 25, Jesus, therefore, encourages his disciples to pursue Christ-likeness. Be like me. And again, this is a, a universal principle. That's the reason Paul later on says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Be my imitators as I am an imitator of Christ. See, that's godly influence. That's godly leadership when you can tell people, Follow my example. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's what Paul is saying. Becoming like Jesus Christ. Becoming like your master means receiving the same treatment that Jesus received. And that's what he's talking about. Which he clarifies to the disciples by recognizing that the Pharisees have attributed to him satanic power. Remember that in uh, Matthew 9:34, when they said, well, he casts out uh, the demons by the ruler of demons. And here he's saying, well, they, if they called me Beelzebul, they're going to call you the same. In other words, they're going to second guess your motives. They're going to tell you you're operating by satanic power because they have done the same with me. And Beelzebul is the name of the god of uh, the city of Ekron, the country of the Philistines in 2 Kings 1, 12. Lord of the Flies is the name of this demon and this deity here that later on the Jews associated with Satan himself. So Jesus is recognizing the fact that the Pharisees of his time were attributing to him satanic power. They will commit the same blasphemy in verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 24. So they are insisting in their rejection of Jesus Christ. The point here that Jesus is making is this. If they're doing that to me, they're going to do that to you too. So don't expect, don't expect anything less. So he trains them to fulfill their mission, aware of the fact that insults and accusations and assassination of character will come for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. That's not something we can avoid, church. That is to follow you if you are a faithful believer in Jesus Christ and you desire to follow Christ closely. Guess what? People are going to accuse you of all kinds of things. They're going to second guess your motives and they are going to insult you. Why? Because they did this to him and we're not greater than our master. But here's something even more encouraging that he says in this verse. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you belong to his household. You belong to his family. See, we're not only 
disciples. We're not only followers. We are brothers and sisters of Christ. That's what he says in Matthew 12, verse 50. Whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother or sister and mother. And later Paul says in Galatians 6, verse 10, believers are the household of faith. So church, we're a big family. We're not just learners. We're not just disciples. We are sons and daughters. We are the members of God's household. If they insult the head of the household, they're going to insult you. So Jesus is saying, acknowledge your position. You're not above your master. But this is something even more encouraging about our position in Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in our position and then we respond to opposition accordingly. Criticism accompanies everyone who follows Jesus Christ. People will second-guess you. They will, just like they did with Jesus. But let me remind you of your great position in him. In Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, this is what the Bible says. You are blessed, my friend, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So circle that expression if you have that passage open in Ephesians 1 verse 3. You are in Christ. That is your position. If you're a believer in Christ, in verse 4, furthermore, Scripture says you are chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, predestined to adoption as sons and daughters, verse 5. And in verse 12, it says we are sealed in Him. Again, that's the common denominator. Him. We are in Him, sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of the promise. And who could forget the Beatitudes? Or like I heard sometime this week, the attitudes that should be. The Beatitudes. Why? Because we are blessed. Because we are members of the kingdom of heaven. We are blessed beyond our ability to compute. We are happy in a true sense, in the biblical sense. Not according to the world, but according to God. We are blessed. We are happy. That is our position in Christ. Therefore, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to be concerned about. Furthermore, according to Romans 6, verse 1, you are dead to sin if you are a believer in Christ, but alive to God in Christ. Again, that's the common denominator here. And because we are no longer in Adam, there is no more condemnation for us, the Bible says in Romans 6, 11. See, we were in Adam. We were subjects of the condemnation of the sin of Adam, but because we have passed from death to life, we are now in Christ, no longer in Adam. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No matter the verdict of the court of public opinion. So we are not above Christ. We are in him and he is in us. The Bible says Christ in us is the hope of glory. We are in him and he is in us. Therefore, we should consider it an honor to be opposed, to be insulted, to be criticized, and to be persecuted because of him. In fact, I'll tell you this, church, you will not mature unless you expect those things to happen. We don't panic when they happen. We don't get frustrated. We expect them to happen. Mature, godly spiritual leaders do not panic when they receive insults and betrayals, but they consider them an opportunity to be like Christ, to identify with our Master. The disciples seem to have learned that lesson. According to Luke, in Acts 5, verse 41, they rejoiced that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. See, they rejoiced because they suffered for Christ. And as a result, God used their testimony to mature other people, including you, you and me. We're reading their works. Um, we do this uh, every Sunday. These giants of the faith were ordinary people like you and me that God called for extraordinary service, extraordinary ministry. And they have acknowledged their position. They're not above Christ. They are in Christ. So church, the more you pursue Christ-likeness, the more mature you will be, and the more the world will hate you. Why? Because the world hated Christ. So we shouldn't expect to be popular for being Christians. We shouldn't expect to, to, to have success according to the world. We don't need that. We need to be like Christ. Why? Because he says it is enough for you to be like your master. It is enough for you to be like me. So therefore, that is our goal, church. And the way towards maturity is to acknowledge our position in Christ and rejoice in it. If the world hated Christ, the world will hate you. The more you try to avoid hatred from the world, the less mature you will be. Now, there's a difference between being hated because of Christ and being hated because of your own obnoxiousness. So let's not get the two confused. We acknowledge our position in Christ. But here's the second principle in uh, Jesus' threefold strategy here for 
spiritual maturity. Appreciate your preparation. Acknowledge your position, first of all. Second, appreciate your preparation. That's in verse 26 through 31. Now, Jesus is training his disciples. He is preparing them for ministry here. And he teaches them to deal with a very common human emotion, very common human response to danger in unknown circumstances. We are very familiar with that. That is why he says, do not fear, three times in those short verses. Three times he says, do not fear, do not be afraid. Now, how often does Jesus have to say something for us to trust him, church? Only once. And here he says three times, do not fear. In other words, don't fear this, but fear that. He's saying, let's redirect your fear for you to mature in me. Now, he already told them that they would encounter hardship and conflict, specifically in familial loyalties. He says that brother will betray brother because of me. He repeats that same idea later on. Families will be broken up because of me. So that's the conflict and the hardship that we'll experience as we follow Christ. And that produces fear, of course. But he prepares them by issuing two commands. The first one is, don't fear what people can do to you. Do not fear what the Pharisees can do to you, he says. Although there is no evidence that, no, that anything, any of those conflicts and hardship follow the disciples until after the resurrection of Christ. In other words, doing Jesus' earthly ministry here, they did not experience persecution. That came afterwards. But we understand the, the timeless principle here. He says, do not fear people. We have no business fearing people. Why? Because, if, first of all, he says already... They will do to you what they did to me. You should expect to be treated like me. But second, because it says here, nothing escapes the eyes of the omnipotent and the omniscient God. Even, uh, not even the secret chambers where people plot evil against followers of Jesus Christ. This is what the author of Hebrews says concerning this attribute of God. Hebrews 4 verse 13, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must answer. Now, Jesus already started to unmask the Pharisees in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember that. He's already started to reveal their real motives. So Jesus says, do not fear them because I know everything. My Father knows everything. And in time, we will vindicate you. That is what he's saying. God always exposes, church. And we need to understand this. God always exposes wrong motives. It may take time, but he always exposes wrong motives and also reveals godly intentions. So therefore, you should spend absolutely no time defending yourself to your critics, to, your, to the people who oppose you because you're a Christian. Why? Because that would be a distraction of your real mission. Your mission is not to talk about you. Your mission is to talk about Jesus Christ. If people are criticizing you, if people are accusing you of wrong motives, pay no attention to them. Because that is what Jesus is saying here, because you have, God didn't call you to be a, a, a defense attorney, primarily, some, some of you may be, but primarily you're called to be a disciple maker if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and therefore God, let, let God take care of that. He will vindicate his servants. Now the disciples uh, would be vindicated even after they died. That's very clear because we read about them afterwards. So... For that reason, Jesus says you should never hesitate to be clear about your message, to be loud and clear about your message. That is the reason why he uses the illustration of shouting from a housetop. Now remember, houses back then, during that time and during, uh, in, in, in that place, had uh, flat tops. Not like today. That, that would be an impossibility. If it, don't do that today. <laughs> don't take that literally. Otherwise, you will fall from your, from your roof. Don't do that. It's much better to knock on your neighbor's door. Now, what Jesus is saying is this. Now, the place where it used to be uh, used for sunbathing and relaxation will, would also be used for announcements to the village. What Jesus is saying is this. You should never hesitate to make those announcements concerning the kingdom of heaven because you should never fear what people will do to you. That is your message. That is your mission. Be faithful to that no matter the cost. And they would have understood that very clearly. Now, they, 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 they didn't take a long time for them to get that illustration. I'm afraid that many Christians don't pay much attention to these principles. They worry more about reputation preservation than kingdom proclamation. All of us are tempted to do that. 
Now, you, you may have heard the expression, well, keep the faith, keep the faith. We're not supposed to keep the faith, church. We're supposed to share the faith. And because of the high cost of sharing the faith, many people reason away. Many people try to explain away their responsibility to share the faith. And they'll say something like this. And I've heard this before. I don't have the gift of sharing my faith. We pay the pastor to do that, which is a profoundly unbiblical idea. And frankly, it's a pathetic way to explain away and to justify a rebellious heart. Look at verse 28. Jesus instructs the disciples to redirect their fear. He says, don't fear people. Don't fear them. Instead, fear someone else. And he reminds them of, of, of a couple more truths here. People may destroy the body, but that's their only jurisdiction. People may assassinate your character, but that's all they can do. They can cancel you, but that's all they can do. They have no jurisdiction of your eternal soul. You should be much more concerned about the one who sends people to heaven or hell. The only two options. The body is going to go to the grave. But your immaterial part is going to go to either heaven or hell, depending on whether or not you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Savior. And Jesus, again, uses a very visual illustration here when he uses the word for hell, Gehenna. That was the location. That was the city dump in Jerusalem where trash would be thrown and there was a fire that would consume all of the, these things 24-7. Uh, so they would understand exactly what he's talking about. And his point is this. The wrath of God is so severe that any punishment inflicted by people should not even compare. You should not even be concerned about what people can do to you. You should be more concerned about where are you going when you die and where people around you are going when they die? Because if you're sure that you're going to heaven, what you need to do is tell people, listen, man, I'm concerned about your eternal destiny. Have you thought about where you're going to spend eternity when you die? Because there are only two options according to the Bible. And divine destruction here that Jesus Christ is talking about here does not mean annihilation. Does not mean you will cease to exist because that would actually provide relief for people in hell. To cease to exist. It, it would put them out of their misery. But the Bible says no. They will suffer forever in the lake of fire. And the Bible also uses the illustration of the never uh, dying worm. Which is a guilty conscience. Remember. Uh, that's in the book of uh, uh, Revelation. We talked about this. Book of Revelation of uh, last year. But listen. Imagine spending eternity with a guilty conscience. Thinking man I should have received Christ as my savior. Now I'm suffering here. I wish I had come to a saving knowledge of Christ. He wants his disciples to understand the holiness of God. That is the reason why he says God punishes people who refuse to come to Jesus Christ. Now, that is a complete unpopular notion. That is a very, un, un, uh, I guess, un-American or un-Western way to define God who's all loving. Well, God is all loving, but he's also holy. He cannot tolerate sin, and he sends sinners to condemnation. But the point is, what Jesus is saying is this. His disciples needed to understand the holiness of God and the seriousness of the mission. Why? Because they would launch the Christian movement after the resurrection, and they would lead the church. These guys would be the leaders of the early church. They needed to get these things right. They, need to, they needed to have their theology correct, the holiness of God correctly here. And what he's saying is, you should understand the holiness of God so that compassion for unbelievers would outweigh your instinct for self-preservation. Do we understand that? Our compassion for unbelievers, church, should outweigh our natural instinct for self-preservation. That is maturity. That is Christ-likeness. So if that's true, then I should consider my neighbor's eternal destiny more important than my physical body, than my physical life, my physical comfort. You say, Pastor, I don't know about that, man. That is so countercultural. That is so counterintuitive. And that's right. It is because we learn from an early age to self-preserve. We learn from an early age that we need to fight for our rights, that we need to assert our rights, that we need to think of ourselves first. The Bible says something different. This is what the Bible says, Philippians 2, verse 3. Paul, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. 
So if we really want to be like Christ, if we want to really want to mature, we need to understand this, that the eternal destiny of my neighbor who's outside of Christ is more important than my comfort. That is more important than my desire of not being insulted. We should not care about what people are going to talk concerning us and question our motives if we really understand the holiness of God. We should fear for our unsaved friends and family so much that the risk of being insulted like Christ was should not even cross our minds. Think about this for a moment. What is the primary need, well, the primary reason we don't share the gospel with unsaved family, friends, family and friends? It's not apathy. We care about them. It's not that we don't care about them. It's because we fear. That's the number one reason we don't share the gospel is because we fear what people may think of us. We fear being called fundamentalists. We fear being called however people call us these days. I don't know, Bible thump or whatever the case is. We fear being canceled. We fear being politically incorrect. Therefore, we buy into the lie that says you should not share your faith. But listen to what Solomon says. Proverbs 1 verse 7 and again, he's the wisest man who ever lived apart from Jesus Christ. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. So, my friends, if you're looking to grow spiritually and mature, we need to understand this. We need to redirect our fear. We don't fear what people think. We don't fear what people can do to us. We need to fear the Lord. And it doesn't mean we're terrified of coming into the presence of the Lord because he invites us to do that through prayer. What, what the Bible says is we need to have a reverent, healthy fear of violating his holiness. And we must fear for the people who are outside of Christ so much that we need to go and tell them about Jesus Christ. Now, of course, we don't want to create a conflict unnecessarily. Again, like I said before, all you need to do today is tell people that you believe this book. All hell will break loose in your life. Imagine what happens when you start preaching it. So... We don't need to, we don't want to create um, conflict unnecessarily. And as servants of Christ, we need to understand that as far as it depends on us, we need to have peace with all men. That's what the Bible says, Romans 12, verse 18. But we must draw the line. And that line is, that line is draw when it comes to truth. We do not compromise there. And let me quote again to you the words of my hero of the faith, Adrian Rogers, one of them. Quote, I prefer to be divided by the truth than united in error. Close quote. Look at verse 29. Jesus now comforts the disciples using a very simple illustration meant to communicate not only their need to not fear men, but to fear God and also to turn that fear into trust. That is the purpose of the next illustration here, the imagery of the sparrows that are worth a penny. And this is what he means. Compared to people, sparrows have a relatively low value. These were birds used for them. They're not pets. These were birds that people would buy them to eat, to serve them as finger food. They would fry them. And the Bible says their value is an asarian. That's the Roman coin, copper coin here, represented one sixteenth of a denarius, a day's wage. So very low in value here. And what, what Jesus is saying is, is this God's sovereign care for even these cheap creatures, God, God's sovereign care extends. To these cheap creatures, how much more do you think that God cares for you, who is an image bearer, who is made in the image of God, called upon to have dominion on the earth? Think about that, Jesus is saying. That is another reason you shouldn't fear men, but you should focus your attention on the one who really cares for his image bearers. And he ordains the, uh, the seemingly insignificant and mundane details of people's lives, illustrated here by the hairs on our heads. And I am out of jokes about how much it's easier for God to do that for me than for you, to count the hairs in our heads. The point is, it took you a while. It took some of you a while to get that. Wow. <laughs> the point is, Jesus cares about the seemingly insignificant details of your life, the ones you don't even think about. He cares so much for you. That you shouldn't fear what people can do to you because if he cares for you, he will protect you. And sometimes he allows things to happen to us that we would choose otherwise. Events in our lives that we would vote it, that we didn't want them to happen. But remember, 
he's saying this to people he's throwing to the wolves. He said, I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, you have nothing to fear because I am the good shepherd. I can shepherd you from a distance, he says. So God ordains every circumstance of our lives, even the ones we don't think about. Now, birds may reflect the creativity of God, but you and I reflect the image of God, and therefore, we have much more value. Jesus didn't die on a cross for birds. He died on a cross for you and for me, for people. And by the way, church, let me ask you this. That prompts us to ask you this. What part of you are valuable do we not understand? What part of that affirmation is hard for us to understand that God cares about us? We are valuable to Him. Now, do you need a clearer affirmation of divine love than this? Friend, you are precious to God. So much so that He takes care of every detail of your life. Now, let me remind you from the Word of God, this very principle that Jesus is saying here, so that there's no question in our lives. This is all throughout the Scriptures here. Listen, Paul says to Titus in Titus 2 verse 14 that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. In other words, we belong to God because of what Christ has done for us. I go back to what we said in the beginning, Ephesians 1, that we are sealed in him. The seal is a mark of ownership. We belong to God because of what Christ has done. In fact, Paul says it clearly in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 23, you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. And Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, referring to believers, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So church, you can't miss it. You belong to God. He cares about you, and part of your maturing is to understand that truth and realize that part of your training is to go through crisis, is to go through the fires of persecution or criticism here in America. Really, that's the worst that can happen. You may lose your job, but not your life here in America yet. For these reasons, we should never fear people. When they rise up against you, I need you to know this. When people rise up against you because you're a follower of Christ, they are messing with the divine property. They are trespassing divine property. That's a bad idea. Some of you have in your houses that sign that says, trespassers will be shot in sight, something like that. Trespassers will, will be bitten. My chihuahua will, will persecute you, some, whatever. My, my, my lap dog will bite you. You know, you get the idea. When you're messing with divine property, that is a bad idea. And God wants us to know this, that he's got you covered, even the seemingly insignificant details of your life. Why? Because he takes control of your eternal soul. People can only mess with the body. Yes, they can assassinate your character. They can talk bad about you. They can talk behind your back. But your eternal destiny has been settled on the cross if you're a believer in Christ. And that's what matters. And furthermore, Jesus promises here to expose people's true motives in time. So godly, mature spiritual leaders master the art of redirecting fear and turning them into trust. They recognize danger when it comes. Of course, danger comes all the time. Who hasn't feared this year? I experience fear all the time. And you do too. We recognize when we get anxious uh, and we get nervous when we are thrown into the unknown, but we turn to God immediately for, immediately for wisdom and protection. That's what we should do if we are to mature. And because we understand and appreciate God's sovereign love, a position from men should not even be a concern. Mature God leaders don't even care about that. Now, again, how many times does Jesus have to tell you, do not fear before you believe him? We have no reason to fear what other people can do. If they slander us, they give us an opportunity to be like Christ because they've slandered Christ. If they kill us, we wake up in heaven. What can be better than that? Now, we must not only acknowledge our position and appreciate our, prepar our preparation, but here's a third item in Jesus' threefold strategy for spiritual maturity here. And then the third and last one, verses 32 through 33. Assimilate his promise. We acknowledge our position, we appreciate our preparation, and now we assimilate his promise. Now, he concludes this paragraph here. How do we know that, church? Because he uses the word therefore. That's what the therefore is there for to conclude what he's talking about. 
And he concludes this paragraph with a promise, which he frames in the context of a contrast proposition. In other words, verse 32 contrasts verse 33. Why does he do that? Because the disciples would have been tempted to deny association with Jesus when persecuted came. And that's exactly what happened when Peter denied Christ. Remember Passion Week? Uh, before the crucifixion, G uh, Peter denied Christ. Why? Because it feared men. And the disciples would have been tempted to do that. But the good thing is the grace of God is on display here so much, especially in the life of Peter. It's so encouraging. Keep listening. The fear of men tempts Christians to deny Christ publicly. That's precisely what caused Peter to do it. And amazingly, God, or I should say Christ, demonstrated his grace to him not only in giving him an opportunity to confess him before men, which he did in Acts 2, verses 14, verse 36. In other words, that denial of Peter was not the end of the story for him. That denial was just a learning opportunity, a preparation, if you will, in his maturing. Because later on in Acts 2, verses 14 through 36, the same guy preached a sermon that pierced the hearts of people, proverbially speaking, of course, and they came to Christ. And not only that, but Jesus recruited him for pastoral ministry. Because in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, Peter says, I write to you as a fellow elder. In other words, not as a pope, but as a fellow elder, as a co-laborer in Christ. That's the grace of, of God. And he makes a promise here uh, that, that he, people confess him before uh, men. He would confess them before the Father. The word confessing. Here in Greek, homologeo means to speak the same. It means to affirm, to agree with. In other words, when someone confesses Christ, he or she affirms who Christ is, and they affirm his, uh, their allegiance to him publicly. They agree with his self-identification and his ministry, as well as his claim on their life. So in other words, when you confess Jesus Christ publicly, what you're saying to the world is this, I belong to him. I agree with what he says in his word that I belong to him. I am his. I agree with him that I am a sinner saved by grace, that if it weren't for the grace of God, my destiny would have been hell. I agree with that. That's what it means to confirm Christ publicly, to confess, rather, to confess Christ publicly. But what we have learned so far is that that confession invites conflict and hardship. Yes, of course it does. Um, that's not a popular notion today. It may even sever family ties. Remember, we saw this a couple weeks ago, and then we'll see it again. Families will be torn apart because of allegiance to Christ, and it happens all over the world, in Muslim families, in Mormon families, in, in other cults. When people come to the knowledge of the true Christ, there is a conflict that takes place in their family. But Jesus then sheds light into his, into his uh, ministry of mediator between God and men. That's why he's saying this. He's saying, I am your mediator. There is no other person who can mediate between you and God. You need a mediator to get to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says somewhere else. And here he's saying, I am the only way to get to the Father. Therefore, if you confess me before uh, men, I will confess you before the Father. That's what he means. Um, but that's what Paul means when he says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. In other words, there's no point in praying to dead saints because they can't hear you. Christ is the only one who is alive today who mediates between God and people. And the Bible says that. Furthermore, the book of Hebrews says, chapter 9, verse 15, Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the violators that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. That's the mediation of Christ, and that's what he's talking about here. A godly, mature follower of Christ does not fumble with the opportunity to confess publicly his or her allegiance to Christ, no matter the cost. Why, church? Because, think about this, the Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you, if you have Christ, if your heart is full of Christ, that's what's going to come out of your mouth anyway. But if, if you're full of self, if you're full of self-centeredness, all you're going to talk about is you. Or if your mind is, if your heart is in, I don't know, riches or the things of this world, that's what you're going to talk about. But if you are, if your heart is filled with Jesus Christ, evangelism is not going to be, even be a problem for you because you talk about what matters to you. 
How do you talk about your children? How do you talk about your spouse? Hopefully you talk <laughs> well about your spouse. Because you love them. You talk about your family because you love your family. Your heart is filled with them. It should be the same thing with your Savior, my friends. You should talk about Jesus Christ. It shouldn't even be a matter of debate. It shouldn't be, I shouldn't be twisting your arm to share Christ with other people because it should come naturally. You should be motivated by love and gratitude. And the mature disciple fears denying Christ more than he fears men. Listen to what Paul says. Again, how he expresses the sentiment. This is all over Scripture. Romans 1, 6. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, he says. But unfortunately, many Christians affirm affiliation with Jesus with their mouths, but deny him with their lifestyle. I've seen this happen many times. I have done it, quite frankly, many times, and so have you. I wonder if that's what caused many unbelievers to say sarcastically this non-prayer. Jesus, save me from your followers. Have you heard this before? I've heard this in sarcasm and in criticism to Christians. Perhaps that's what causes them, the fact that we confess Jesus with our mouths, but we don't live, we don't walk like, uh, like we should. Point is, probably none of us here are going to be asked to deny Jesus at gunpoint here in this country, at least not in our lifetime, I don't think. Although this happens in any other parts of the world, for us, association with him may risk a career, perhaps popularity and notoriety. But if we understand the fear of God, the, the way Jesus is putting it here, no one around us should doubt who we represent. In other words, people shouldn't be surprised to learn that you're a believer. Is that clear? Now, church, if you hear the following comment, you're a Christian? When you say to someone that you're a Christian, you should be concerned, especially with this voice inflection. You're a believer? I didn't know that. <laughs> you should review and reevaluate your testimony and your allegiance to Christ. You should mature, as so as well, I've heard this before in my Christian walk. Maybe some of you have also. I hope that that's a, a learning experience for all of us. Now, Jesus does not imply, of course, that God will deny you if you bought your Christian testimony. Who hasn't done that before? That's not what he's saying here. And again, look at the life of Peter for encouragement. But what he's saying is, is we should not base our assurance of salvation on the quote-unquote sinner's prayer or a commitment card that we filled out years ago if these confessions don't really reflect at least the desire in our hearts to reproduce the character of Christ. You understand that? If you claim to be a believer, but you don't have the desire in your heart to reproduce the character of Christ, something doesn't add up. There's an issue, and you need to mature. Now, if that's the case, it won't take someone with a sword to get you to deny Christ. All it takes is a crisis, whether global or, or, or personal. And I've, you've heard me say this many times before. One of the reasons I praise God for the pandemic is because crisis reveals character. When you go through a crisis, whether global or personal, that crisis has the power of bring, bringing to the surface what's in the, in the hidden chambers of your heart because you need to deal with them. That's, uh, that, that happens all the time when we face crisis. God reveals character during crisis. So for that reason, I ask you, does your life affirm the character of your Savior in the way you're dealing with the 2020 pandemic? Are you fighting the wrong fights, friends? Are you losing friendships because of masks? How ridiculous is that? Are you losing friendships because of political affiliation? And there's something much more important at stake, and that is your affiliation with Christ, your testimony, your walking with Christ. How do you respond to crisis? How did Jesus respond to the biggest crisis of his life? I'm glad you asked because the Bible talks about that. Hours before the crucifixion, this is what Jesus prayed. And by the way, he was uh, experiencing a high level of anxiety, not because of the physical pain he was about to endure, but the spiritual pain and having the face of the Father turned from him. That's why he said on the cross, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Well, the reason for that is he had to turn his face away from the Son temporarily so that he wouldn't fit, turn his face forever from you and me. But Jesus prayed this, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
So church, I ask you, are you like your master? Because if you are, you will pray something like this. Lord, I don't like the situation. Father, I am so done with this crisis. Can you please remove this from my life? Yet, not my will, but your will be done. However long you want me to endure in this, Lord, give me grace. Give me sustaining grace to go through this. And he will. He has never denied that prayer to anybody, ex personal experiencing uh, uh, included. And you have personal experience as well. When you are praying for God to change a situation, and you months praying, Lord, is this ever going to end? Change the situation. And he doesn't change the situation. In fact, the situation gets worse. He changes your heart about the situation. Why? Because you've experienced maturity. You've experienced dependence on him. You've experienced closeness with Christ. And people behind, around you will say, that is a Christ-like person. They don't panic when a crisis hit. They don't go crazy. They remain steadfast in trusting the Lord. That is a hallmark, a hallmark of a godly, mature person. Jesus' last word in his paragraph. I want you to take a look at that. Even though he mentioned hell using the word Gehenna, what's the last word in, his, in this paragraph here, church? Somebody shout it out. Heaven. Heaven. And we see here that even though God may send people to hell who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, Christ is giving them a tremendous opportunity to hope. Why? Because it says, my Father who is in heaven. Now, God is not limited to heaven. I need you to understand that. That is the omnipresence of God. God is all over. He is everywhere at the same time with his whole being. His presence covers not only creation, but outside of creation. In other words, God is present not only in what he created, but in what he hasn't created. You understand that? But heaven is the control room of the universe, if you will. And Jesus is saying, my Father who is in heaven will hear my prayers on your behalf as in my mediatorial role confessing you before the Father. And I can only imagine what that confession will be like. And I'll go back to Ephesians 1, verse 3, all the way through verse 6. And perhaps it would sound like this. Father, you blessed Brian. You blessed the Zhang family. You blessed John C. You blessed Paul. And you blessed Kevin. And you bless uh, Mark with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in me. You chose them in me before the foundation of the world that they would be holy and blameless before you. You predestined them to adoption as sons and daughters through me to yourself according to the good pleasure of your will to the praise of the, of the glory of your grace in which you favored them in me. Imagine Jesus Christ confessing you to the Father like this because you've confessed him before men. In church according to Luke, Jesus says this, Luke 6, verse 40, A student is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. So church, your goal is to be fully trained. Now Jesus is in the business of training people. How do we know that? Because Paul says he began a good work in you, and he will perfect it until the day of Christ. He began a good work in you. You can resist that process. It's your loss. Or you can embrace the pain that comes, but it's just like a vaccine. We've been talking about vaccines, haven't we? It's the pain of the sting that lasts for a little bit, but the, the effects are long-lasting. This week, we have heard that there's a light at the end of the tunnel for this pandemic to be over, haven't we? We've been hearing this a lot. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's hope. Uh, but, uh, and that's great news. We rejoice with that. But there is a much deadlier pandemic out there, a spiritual one that we should be much more concerned about, and that is called sin. Many people will receive inoculation from the coronavirus, but tragically, many of them will die one day and go to hell because they refuse to come to faith in Jesus Christ. There's a light at the end of that tunnel. And that light is called Jesus Christ. And he offers to people, come to me today, you will be saved. I will not turn you away. If you come to him today, the Bible says, in fact, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts and come to Jesus Christ. For those of you either in this auditorium or at home watching this, if you're not yet in Christ, your position is you are condemned. You need to come to Jesus Christ today and receive life. Your life will change, of course. I can't promise your life will get better. It may even get worse. People will hate you because you belong to Christ. But again, do not fear what men can do to you. 
Fear the thought of spending eternity separated from your creator. That is terrifying. So I want to encourage you to come to Jesus Christ if you haven't already. All you do, the Bible says, is you place your trust in him. And you acknowledge, uh, you confess him. You acknowledge who he is and what he's done on the cross to save you. And then the Bible says you will become a citizen of heaven, a subject of the kingdom of heaven. And your name will be written in the book, uh, in the book of life. And therefore, you will belong to him. You will, you will be no longer a creature of God. You're now part of the family. If you're not sure how to do that, it is our joy to teach you or to walk you through how you become saved. Don't hesitate to let us know. For now, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and the opportunity to come together, even in a limited sense, and open the Word of God and rejoice in the Word of God, Lord. Your Word is like water to our thirsty souls, Lord. Oh, we learn here that we are valuable to you, Lord. The world doesn't consider us valuable. Maybe people don't consider us valuable, but Lord, we fear nothing from people, Lord, because you have already said that we are valuable much more than sparrows, and you take care of the minute details of our lives, the, the, even the ones we don't even think about, and that is because we are in Christ. There is no merit in any of us in coming to Christ. You get all the credit. We are in the receiving end of that favor, Lord, and what a great one. We have so great a salvation, Lord. It is our great honor and privilege to be ambassadors of Christ, to represent him in in a world that doesn't know you, in a world that is panicking because of the thought of death. We don't fear death, Lord, because death ushers in eternal life for us. In fact, if people kill us, we wake up in heaven. What can be better than that, Lord? We, don't, we understand that we're not to be careless, of course. We must wear our masks and do all of these things, Lord, but ultimately our eternal destiny belongs to you. And Father, uh, we are not afraid. In fact, it's the season of joy. In fact, every day is a season of joy. But now, Lord, we are celebrating that unto us a child is born and a Savior has been given to us. And, Father, we celebrate that. And one of the best ways I can think of celebrating that is to announce it on the house tops and to announce it to the whole world that Jesus Christ saves. And he is in the business of changing people from the inside out. Why? Because we are valuable to you. You said it in your word, Lord. And we thank you for that. And, Lord, we pray that anyone of us here who is, is yet to come to Christ, that decision will take place today, this afternoon, Lord, so that you will be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.